another week. Uh, tonight I'll let George do a fair bit of the talking. I'm just a little bit under the weather still. Back on the man. Uh, going to get into the plumbing end of it. But first off, we'll complete what we brought on the shingling end of it. I imagine somebody has come up with some questions once we're home or something like that. Anybody sort of something that they think they needed looked at? I wonder about you guys sometimes. <laughs> Did you tell me everything that you covered last week? <laughs> if you've got time later or... You can, you can watch it on channel 12 <clears throat> and as long as you understand Mandarin Chinese, okay. you, you got no problem. Okay, perfect. It's all covered there. <laughs> uh, we'll take a go at the shingles there. I'll let George show you how to repair where the three tab is. Uh, been torn out. I tore one out there and we'll actually apply a few shingles in an area and show you. The one thing I wanted to tell you, if you're using a three tab, which is usually your most economical shingle, uh, if you're doing more than a repair, like say you're doing a roof of a garage or something, your layout of how you're going to do it is what's important. I always tell you to take a look on the back of the package of shingles because it has a world of information on them. It gives you mailing patterns and what you should do if you're going to do like that. I've done a half tab where the line only moves it. Some people do what's called a quarter tab, where they only move over four to six inches at a time. Ideally, once you've stripped your roof and put your new ice shield and water guard, you'll put your black paper from the ice shield and water guard up, snap a few lines with the chalk line. Uh, my chalk line is the I have mine here in my bag. <clears throat> Ideally, you want to keep the rows straight that you're working with. First line that you'll want is for your starter strip across the bottom. And when you're done, you'll measure your shingle and always leave approximately one inch overhanging the edge. You'd snap a line here and then lay your first shingle going this way. You would snap a line from the edge of your roof one tab in. And then move over if you're going to go a half a tap. If they're a 12 inch tap, you would move six inches and snap a line. That way, when you're going up the roof, you're always starting on those lines. You look up the roof as you're starting it. That way, it keeps the line straight going up. Chalk line is a pretty inexpensive tool to throw in your kit. It's something that if you're cutting plywood, you can snap a line. You don't have to put a straight edge on it. Flat. They're pretty handy for doing a lot of things. The only place to caution people not to put a line like this is under vinyl flooring. Those colors will come through vinyl. I went into a home years ago, it was a million dollar home, and I could read all the dimensions on the vinyl that the person that was saving themselves money installed it used a ballpoint pen to write their measurements on the back side while they were cutting placed it down, took about a month, the glue softened everything up, and those dimensions actually showed through. So a soft leaded pencil is always appropriate for something like that. If you use these lines, you should stay straight all the way up this way with the lines. For somebody who doesn't shingle a lot, if you're doing it with a hammer and nail, Pop a line every so often as you're going up the roof that you can measure back to the row of shingles from as you're going. That way you can correct it before it gets too far out. If you're using a nailer, which I use a lot of, and you can rent them quite reasonably now, I'll show you. For loading, you got a coil? 
They have a gauge on the bottom of them, and the gauge, <laughs> you slide up to the last row of shingles and put your new row of shingles up against here, and it keeps the row, say, coverage all the way up. So that's a good way of cheating them doing it. That's typically how roofers do it. Or they'll use the little cuts in the shingle, and they know from experience that you can place them. And we can show you that on the roof there once we go to do a few of them. It's very easy once you catch on to the system. And if you're not worried about your time, snap an extra line across here and here. The key is the closer you get to the top, you want the last few rows to look reasonably straight so that when you put your ridge cap, which is the shingle that goes over the peak of the roof, to look so that it's all got the same reveal of the shingles below. And there again, you would snap a line down half the distance. So you'd have your peak, you would snap a line, say six inches down, or whatever your coverage is of your shingle, and your ridge cap, which you bend like this, when you apply it, you would keep the line on the front the straightest, because obviously if it's on the back side or on the side that's hard to see, you, you won't notice if it wanders a little bit. I'll get George to show you on the roof now, a bit of the shingles and that, and then I'll get into the plumbing. Yes, Let's go <coughs> over here so we can have a look at it. Dennis was talking about three tab, all right? Three tab is, is one of these, you see? One, two, three tabs, that's where they get the name from. There are other types, you see there that uh, different types of shingle all together, all right, with the different systems. And the whole thing about installing these is what Dennis said, on a package or a bundle of shingles, it's wrapped in plastic, and it has everything right there that's really kind of neat. It shows you where to put the nails, all right? It shows you how far you're supposed to be going up or down, and uh, how this tar paper, this thing works, uh, in regards to uh, uh, where the next one goes, because this will seal. When you put the next row on, this tar will seal to the next the next shingle. As soon as the sun gets at that, you see, that just melts it to the one underneath. So it, it really glues the same shingle down. All right, now, this used to be probably the most common type of shingle you would see, the three tab. Uh, and oftentimes, let's say the wind got underneath that, it got, all right, it didn't glue down the way it should. You see how there's a little, little tar strip here, when the sun gets at that, that's supposed to hold, that's supposed to melt that little tab down and hold it down. Uh, if you happen to see uh, on your roof that things are flapping, all right, and it hasn't broken off yet, it's a real good idea to, to uh, help it out. And the roof tar that comes in a little tube, you know, like with a caulking gun, you just put a little bead right where that black tar thing is, put it back down and it'll hold that down for you. And it'll prevent you from getting into future problems with your shingles if it's flopping in the wind. You can actually fix them so that they don't get any worse. Okay, let's say assume the worst has happened and one of these tabs has been flopping and it broke off, all right? Now you can see right in here, all right, that the, where, this, where this has been uh, nailed and uh, how it's been, uh, uh, laid out. Very simple process. <clears throat> to repair that, you can actually flip underneath there and see where that nail is and pop those off. Okay. Oops, sorry. And then that shingle should pull out of there.
Okay. Now you would, uh, you'd have room now for you to put your other, you don't have to worry about those nails that are there. Tap them back down. All right, and we get another three tab. You don't have any gray, do we, Dennis? Did you use it all up? At any rate, there's the uh, shingle we got to put in there. And your uh, shingle knife, is it in here? All right, couldn't see it for looking. You see, this is a beauty. You see that little blade that's on there? That's designed specifically for cutting shingles. All right, it just hooks on, and you just run it down, and it cuts it. Okay, and it's really, really kind of neat. Now, all of this, now can be slid up in there. Take the knee off that. <laughs> Dennis is going to give me a talking to for doing it this way. But that goes up underneath there. And the same place as the other one. And you notice that you've got your lines. All right, that all should be, this line should line up with this line. Pop those nails right here. I can pop them out of there. I was trying to get away with that, but I'm not going to get it all. This time. You'll find you're going to probably have a few holes along the way here. Pizza. Advice to keep a bucket of roofing tar around or even in the caulking tubes. They come in the small ones or the large ones. Anytime you have to pop a nail like this for George has to go the shingle, it's going to damage the shingle slightly. Don't worry about that because you'll renail that shingle, fix it with a little bit of tar, and then make certain when you're tarring it that you tab the layer above it and then this one as it comes down. They're designed that that tar strip will seal it down once the sun gets on it. But say it's in this time of year in the, the winter and you notice that something's torn on the roof and you don't want moisture to infiltrate your hole because that's the key. You'll end up with damage. Okay. Oops, good on the Alright. Right there. So he just left this, nail this area. In fact, you, you grab that compressor. <coughs> and the nails go right back to the same place as all the others are. Alright? I'll have to put one in there and there and there. And then I flip this up and put another roll in here. Alright, so we've got the catches there, there, and there. Beg your pardon? That's correct. That's correct. That's correct. So your nail actually go right there where the tire line is. Oh, maybe too far. Most three tab shingles want a nail on either side of this. That way, if one tab decides to tear or catch in the wind, the nails will hold it. So that's why if you ever listen to guys nailing with nailers on the roof, bang, 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 bang. They go. And you do the same up here. Okay, and the ones that I popped out of there. So now that he's got it that way, uh, I had a pail of roof in And then he'll, he's going to come back with this, and you, and you put a bead in here. Any flap that you lift it up, you seal back down again on those tar spots.
They never will. So you always make sure you get the one below it. So this one, you're going to get the one underneath it. Yes. So that when they blow off, or if they do, you're going to have that other one secured so they don't all blow off. Yes. So once you've done that, you would take your roofing tarp. You can either buy it like this, and I always just use a shim. Piece of wood. Or an old stir like, stick. Like a buttering knife. And you would dab it under each shingle and do it two rows above and at least any of them that you've moved below, because this should be still stuck. But always take and just flip it with your finger, and if it does come up, just dab it. Or if you're getting with a caulking gun, just take and I always put like a little swipe here and a little swipe here. That way then, if you just step on it, once you've done it, they'll all stick down. And that's the key to keeping a roof sealed up, is making certain that none of these flap in the wind. Because once they start, Mother Nature's got more force than you can imagine. I've seen whole sections of roof peeled off once the wind gets underneath and starts rolling with it. I think uh, I need to uh, repeat what was said last week. And then if you'll notice that when we start a roll, all right, there's actually another roll of shingles underneath this, full width. You can see it over here, come around to the side. There's two things that are achieved by having this shingle facing this way, all right, uh, to start both up all the way up the roof on one side and all the way across the bottom, you need this one shingle that's backwards. See how the, the flap is on the inside? This is solid here. So that when the shingle line gets here, you've got solid shingle underneath. All right? And it hangs, overhangs one inch all the way around the roof. And that double layer at the start and on the edge, all right, is double thickness. When the sun gets at it and gets it warm, it doesn't droop or bend over the edge. You'll often see the shingles where they're drooping down into your rain gutters. Often it's because they put too much of an overhang. People are thinking that they're achieving something by giving it a little more extra run for water. The problem is when the sun gets at it, they get soft and they just bend around and now the water will start to curl underneath and, and you've got water issues with your fascia. All right? So that one inch is, is, is pretty important. That's a standard thing. It gives it enough strength with the double layer of shingles. All right? Now, you'll see, uh, I want, can everybody see this first piece of flashing that he's got here? <coughs> This is when you're up against the, another piece of the house, all right, and you need to make sure that you understand how water works. If water can get into a place, it will, all right? Now, um, let's go with the, do you want to change the, the style of shingles on this side? Doesn't matter, whichever. All right. Let's go with a different style. This is not a three tap. <clears throat> all right, the next roll, if you mind, all right? Comes down so that it lines up with that one inch overhang. <coughs> all the way on the ed edge and all the way out. And then the nailing pattern would be shown on your package for a, this is not a three tab, and I don't have the nails anymore. There's a compressor sitting there if you set it up. Then we can, <coughs> we can nail the that out. All right. And do we have a, an actual? I got my nailer. Oh, you've got your nailer already here? Yeah. Uh, it hardly makes any noise. Yeah. I think the plug in's just behind right the camera. Right behind you there. Well, you stay right where you are. I'm just going to move this over to here. Okay. Should reach that plug in. Anybody want to talk before I plug this in? Uh, 
This is what's called a coil nailer. All the nails couldn't get to it. All Sorry, the nails Dennis. come in a strip. And it's fed through the gun. Who wants to nail these shingles on? Anybody want to try this gun? You put your finger like this and then you hit it with them. You can, you can see where the nails were. Right? Just, move over. just move over a little bit just so you don't hit the same nail. It, 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 it won't fire unless you push down on the roll. It's a safety mechanism. There you go. Well, I'll show you. Watch well, Dennis show you a little trick. He's got his Ideally, finger Ideally, on. once you've done this for a lot, you hold the gun. He, he holds the finger down and just as soon as you touch that little spring on the end, there's a it'll fire. Alright? So you bang, 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 and you can do it. But if you're uh, that should now ideally you should have your step flashings to go up this side like George had said. You always want them that you'll cover the nail. Oh, I'm sorry. If you just cover the nail with that side, the next shingle goes on. And the reason I'll hit it up here is the siding, once you put it on, whether it's a J channel or it has a hardy board siding, there's a trim piece that goes over this that allows you to stop moisture from getting in here. The idea of this is so that if moisture gets in, this will shed it down the side of here. So when you put your next... Right here, I got it right here. Oh, too short. Ideally, I had these shingles so that this was a shorter piece. These are what's called an architectural shingle. Some people find there's a part line where they're cut in the ends that they can use as a guide that hooks on the top portion. I would just use this or the gauge on the bottom of the gun you push up. This one needs to be reset because there's a half inch too far down. You can see. Before you do it, you see what he's talking about? You see the gauge? He puts it on there and that tells you the, the distance it is to the next shingle, the bottom of the next shingle. You can preset these. There's an Allen key in the bottom. If your coverage here is what you're wanting, you would set from this point to here with that. So that when you went like this, that would just plop down against the gun. You hold it and pop that edge. For architecturals, I always just use the cut of the shingle because this portion is always the same. So you can here. Then you would put your next step flashing in. And you'll notice that he puts this on so that you're, you know how water works, remember what I'm talking about. This step flashing uh, is, is overlapping the one that's underneath it. It's also overlapping on the shingle, and when you put the shingle down, you do not see the step flashing. So the next shingle comes and covers this, but it also provides that the water runs from one, one piece to the next piece to the next piece, and it's perfectly waterproof. Sealed I, I like the architectural shingles because they're a random pattern. You can be off a little bit on your lines. You don't require the lines to go up as long as you've offset them. And whatever you cut off the end of one, you can start the next row. Whereas opposed to a three tab, you're restricted to the 12 inch or whatever they are. Some of them are 12s, the metrics are a little different. George is trying to cut himself. So. <laughs> That's how you would cut a ridge cap. 
but, ideally, but not with, with holding it over your knee not like I am. Like George is doing it. You do it down here where it's safer. The reason he's cutting them back is so that as you take that shingle, you're going to do this. You'll nail it along this edge, just at the tar line, up about an inch, inch and a quarter or so, inch and a half. The next one goes like so that. The next one covers. The next one goes like that. Until you get out to the outside edge, where you would cut a shingle off this way, and then use it to cover it. You would end up with two nails exposed, which you would put then what on top of? Your roofing tar. That way, then you've covered the two nails. I had to make sure you were listening. Now, <clears throat> what uh, in, in, in Brandon, Manitoba, uh, in the winter time, particularly or most of the time all year, what direction do we get the wind from? Uh, Ninety or eighty percent of our winds come from the northwest. Okay, so it blows this way. You a lot this? of people who, are, who put these ridge caps on, all right, try to remember that. All right, so now, like if the wind was coming from this direction and you put all your ridge caps like this, you're leaving the ridge caps susceptible to wind getting underneath. All right, uh, so in Brandon, Manitoba, if you've got a wind, if you've got a roof that runs direction directly opposite to the wind, you're better off running your, your ridge cap the other way. Now the wind blows over top of the, of that uh, joint, all right? So keep that in mind, depending upon how your house is situated on your, on your lot, okay? Ideally, with the way I've got this laid out here, you would put one more row at least to get up high enough so that your ridge cap would be coming down either to this line or over it. I never worry if it ends up being a little more coverage. I, I worry if you end up with it up here and you don't have enough coverage. Always try and take your next row of shingles so that it goes up and then pulls over the top of the roof. I can take a shingle of the roof. and then just hold it over like that. That way then the, <coughs> the ridge is actually a solid one piece. The only thing you're gonna have will be a gap at each shingle so that when you put your ridge cap on, there it comes down here. See, that's, that's where you want the ridge cap to come. Remember he's talking about snapping a line? You would put it. So if this is four and a half inches, you would snap that line end in. And then you, you put all your ridge caps on that line on this side. And then you got a nice straight roll right down the peak. Is there any questions, any questions or issues? Or there would be another step flashing coming from the other side that would come up to here. And what I've done sometimes is cut a flashing so that the one here comes down and it just splits. You'll find you'll put building paper or black paper, tie back on the wall. It comes down to within this area as well. So it gives you another layer of protection. But if you're working with an existing home, you're not gonna be able to tear the step flashing out because they're under the siding. So what you'll do is as you're tearing the shingles off, go along this edge and find those nails, work your little pry bar underneath and pop that nail. If you bend that step flashing up as you go, you end up with the row of them on their home up the one side. You slip the shingle under the way we've done here, and if you see how it's covered, don't worry if the step flashing are different sizes. Because of the transition from standard dimensions to metric, shingles varied in widths. So sometimes you may end up with two step flashing that you have to cover the shingle. Keep a few extra step flashing around and just slip an extra one in. You may have to work at cutting this edge to get it to go under. As long as you've got a little bit of a lip, it can only be one inch that goes up this side. Underneath the siding. And just try and work it up in under the siding. 
then you use all the other existing ones and just keep folding them down. Most roofers will do that for you if you're doing it, but if you're doing something as simple as a garage or that, like you were saying, you were looking at doing one side of a garage for yourself, you won't run into this because the garage isn't up against anything. So it's, it's a basic like this. Architecturals are the easiest way for anyone to shingle. Three tab takes a little more layout, but they're not that much tougher. Because you have to make sure that these lines are <coughs> symmetrical or that they're in position. If you look all the way up on the roof, you can see one set of lines perfectly straight this way and that way. You'll notice how I put the sill along the roof. That's on a new roof. Say you've got an existing roof that you wanted to put aluminum fascia on, that it's got all wooden fascia that are, you're tired of scraping and cleaning and that. They make a sill mold that's a nail on. It goes up against the shingles and you tack it on here. And your soffit and fascia will all fit up to it. So this doesn't go under the shingles. You nail, you nail where you see the silver thing. And then you're, this goes underneath this, underneath that little lip there. Because it's designed to hold it as well. So if you've got an older home that has a lot of painted wood and you don't want to be up there sanding and scraping and that, uh, this is an option. Then you can put the pre-finished fascia and clean it up. And there again, like I went over with you, they make these in two basic colors that the lumberyards carry, but there are other options of colors available to you that you can order. So if you pre-plan a project properly, you could order all of the colors and that to coordinate with your home. Does anybody have any other questions on the roofing end of things? Roll. Roll roofing? Roll roofing, yeah. Yeah, pretty um, common. Is that, is it, it's just a shed that kind of goes in. It's like going out much of the way, right? Yeah. Um, is that good to use again on a shed like that, or should I look at shingling if I'm working at all? Roll roofing is a pretty economical way of doing things. Not a lot of people do it anymore, but it is still available. Is it available? Yeah. And if the Aggregate is the only thing that's coming off of the roll roofing, as long as it's not compromised or leaking. I've seen people roll roof over it to eliminate having to tear it off and that. It's not a practice I like because I always say to people, a bundle of shingles weighs roughly 75 to 80 pounds, or a roll roofing is 50 to 75 pounds for the smaller rolls. If you keep adding that, that decreases what the snow load that roof can carry. So the more layers of shingle, the less snow load that roof takes. That's why years ago you used to see lots of guys that re-roof right over. But it's not a recommended practice. It's not in that shape that it's got the green all the rest of the set of roofs and the top. Roll roofing is another product that a lot of people shy away from and that because of, it, it's not as aesthetically pleasing as a shingle. It's not and as well the, nailed or attached either. They always end up with a tar strip that's exposed. You always end up with one strip that's exposed. They do make some that the tar strip fits over the other, but I've had very little to do with some of those and I often wonder about how well it's just going to stick down because then you end up with only a single row of nails holding. So you're depending on the weight of the product <coughs> to stay down. Can you remember Dennis talking in the class about ice shield? And he said ice shield goes on. Ice shield is um, the what goes on before you do any shingling. Right? It's a it's like a rolled roofing, uh, but it's got a plastic on the back that you peel off and it's sticky, right? And it goes on, you should have at least one roll. Dennis, normally you don't have to put two, do you? 
high shield? It, depending on the roof. If it's a low slope roof, I recommend doing two rows of it, which means if it's like this, put two rows at least. Uh, and, and the reason is that, uh, that, that as the winter progresses with heat and cooling and sun and that sort of thing, water will run down and then eventually it will freeze here and you'll get a bump that's right on the outside because as soon as it runs down this part and it gets into the part that's overhanging, this is a lot colder, the water gets here, it freezes. Right? So the ice shield is underneath the shingles and its purpose is to handle the parts when sometimes water will back up underneath the three tabs and freeze and if the ice shield is there, it's still sealed. There's two things that the, the ice shield does. One, it sticks really tight to the roof and secondly, when you drive a nail through it, after it gets warm, that ice shield actually melts around the nail. Right? So that every nail that you put in reseals itself because that ice shield is there. And it, so it, it, you don't have the leaking down here because you've got that one roll of ice shield underneath everything. Okay? The rest of it is just tar paper. It's like it's like 30, a, it's, 36 inches. Yeah, yeah. thank you. It, average 36 or a meter wide roll, which is 39, and it's a membrane similar to these flashings. This is a little lighter, but it has a sticky side that you peel. It comes with a brown paper backing on it, and you peel the backing off, and then it it adheres to the roof. And it's not so sticky that it's impossible to work with. You can still slide it around a bit, but it makes it really stick to the roof. The wood is when it gets warm, right? It actually melts and seals right to the roof, which is, it, which is very important in, in our climate, right? In, in Manitoba, particularly, to have that at least one roll of ice shield. Some roofers have adopted a policy of using products like ice shield and water down on a whole roof because it's like, a, it's like an insurance policy. It seals around all the nails, as George had said, and it's a sealed membrane over the whole roof. So it's like putting a, a plastic blanket down and then putting your product on. So it is a worthwhile investment in that aspect of it. I put a tin roof on the building that I'm living in now, my garage and my addition, and I put ice shield on the entire roof, simply because the, the tin is screwed down. All right, so every place that I put a screw in that tin the tin really, you put a hole in it, all right? So essentially, it's potentially leak. But with the ice shield underneath, wherever it, atta wherever it holds that tin down, it'll seal that, that, that uh, screw. And uh, so, uh, and I, they told me to make sure you put ice shield under the entire roof if you're putting tin down. Sorry? It, it, runs, it runs horizontally on the roof, all right? Oh, and, and yeah, you put the bottom one on, and then the next one overlaps so that the water keeps running. You will notice on the product that there's a four to sometimes six, depending on the manufacturer, a strip that it show, clearly shows you that you would overlap it. That way then it's a continual membrane. One seals to the other. I've seen people as well use a product called Blue Skin, which is a foundation uh, coating, it comes in a roll and it's a manufacturer's name is blue skin. It's even thicker and I've seen it used on roofs, especially sheet metal roofs. Now, yeah, it, actually they're on, yeah. they won't hurt them as long as you, you don't want to leave them on in the summer obviously. It's, they're, they're designed for roofs in older homes that don't have enough ventilation in the eaves, and you'll find it gets ice damming is what it's called, where you get a buildup. You can run them back and forth. I have one here that I showed last week there. Uh, keep them on a switch, uh, an exterior light that has a, a switch on it. As long as it's a heavy enough circuit to carry it, it's not a problem. You turn them on and leave it on. Depending on the product and that square foot price is probably in that dollar fifty, dollar forty.
ideally it, it's insurance on a roof. And not likely wouldn't be that much. Probably in the neighborhood of 50 to 60 cents a square foot would be in line. Most roofers will not put a roof on without the first two rows of it. I don't think I've seen anybody in the trades now that don't. Most warranties for shingles request it. It's just one extra insurance policy for the homeowner. Does anybody want to recover what, uh, how to do uh, uh, these uh, uh, roof vents or, pole or, or, or piping or that sort of thing that stick through the roof and how to do the shingles around it? Uh, we did cover it last week, but does anybody have any questions on that at all? How that overlaps? Okay, good. You know, of course, that you see this part here, it's not nailed, there should be nails, like Dennis said last week. And when you put a nail here, 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 and here, you put a piece of tar, you put the, the roofing tar on top of those nail heads. Right? Anything see, that's exposed. Yeah. It, even if, I, if George looks down on his left hand there, there's a shingle where the tab, and Robin picked it out, where a nail's exposed uh, between yeah, right. the tabs. Like you put it in the wrong place and you can see it in the, in the little crack. If there. you're looking at your roof as you're working and you notice one, take your roofing tar and just touch that nail. You'll never see it. And, and your, your last uh, ridge cap that you put on will have a nail there and there and you should put a tab of tar on that because there's no way of not getting the nail underneath. So. We'll get going on to some of the plumbing. The only thing I didn't grab here tonight is some latex gloves. They usually have some around on that. If you're handling anything around your toilets and such, for years I've never worn them. And then I started doing it as a health precaution because of some of the things you're handling. Even for drains and stuff, when you're cleaning them out. A lot of the time it's vegetable matters, hair, you name it, it can be in there. Those sort of things over time will breed bacteria and molds that can cause you problems. For the most part, average maintenance for home plumbing and that, there's a few tools that you should have. How many people are in a home that's old enough that their iron piping that are twisted together and threaded joints? And, uh, yep, yours would be definitely. <laughs> They can come within a myriad of problems of their own. There are fittings, though, that will help you change over to copper. Pax or Warspool. Pax or Warspool are plastic products. From a maintenance side of it, copper is what I, I like. Uh, the government still pushes in a lot of their buildings copper on water delivery lines. Uh, sewage and waste lines years ago in some homes were copper. They went away from that because the acids in sewer and waste cause corrosion inside of the pipe and can compromise it depending on combinations of the water and what's poured down the pipes. They brittle with age. Now, I can't believe it, but they're doing it. They have what's called a heat recovery tube. It goes in your waste line and it's copper with three quarter inch line wrapped around it. It supposedly is to save you money. You took your water to the hot water heater. As you shower, the warm water goes down the waste pipe, which the water line is wrapped around the exterior of. It's supposed to transfer enough heat to save you money. X percent. I really don't see where the savings are there in the average home, but they are being forced to put them in Brandon area. <coughs> it's a requirement. It's uh, a requirement? requirement? They are now in new, in new builds. Mm -hmm. It's not something that you have to put in if you're just doing some rent operation work in your home. Uh, George and I worked with an energy retrofit program, which is where these shirts came from. We saw the biggest savings for homeowners with your low flow toilets and shower heads and aerators. We had documented facts of 27% savings on water. 40 some. 
and some are higher. What you find is if you look at your water bill that you have from your homes here, it's calculated on your water you use, and then they just double it for the sewer portion that they charge you. So if you're using $25 worth of water, they're charging you for $25 to handle the wastewater. So if you cut down the actual intake, how much water you're using, you're saving twofold because of that. And that's where we found the greatest savings in going from the larger toilets that used a gallon and a half, two gallon flushes to the six liter in that. You, you look at the, at the tank on that toilet, that's a very old toilet that I bought at the ReStore, and it actually is uh, about a three gallon flush. All right, now you think that uh, every time that you push that lever, uh, that's how much water you use. Um, they now have three liter uh, flushes. They have dual flushes that uses a couple liters, depending upon how heavy the load is that you're trying to get rid of, but dual flushes is certainly a choice you have. But at one time, you could buy uh, the toilets that have these big tanks on the back, and they were half the price of a low flush toilet. And the reason at the time was that they had an overabundance of these things, right? And uh, they were putting it on the market at bargain prices. Most of them came out of the states where they are now outlawed. You, uh, you cannot buy a five gallon flush toilet in the United States. But when, they, when the law passed that, that the, they weren't allowed to sell them in any lumber yards, well, the people who had them by the thousands in the United States shipped them to Canada at a bargain price and uh, every uh, lumber yard in Canadian Tire were buying them up because they were cheap. But even Canada now has smartened up. You, you, I think you'd be hard pressed to buy one, could you? No. You couldn't buy a five gallon flush toilet uh, if they don't exist, unless you go to Restore where they got the, the old ones that are they're trying to, to uh, I would try to convince those people there that they should never be allowed to be resold. What you find on toilets, there's a lot of different grades of them. Uh, toilets are usually rated in what's called a MAP rating, which is how many grams of material that toilet can clearly pass through. Ideally, you look for a toilet that's a thousand or more MAP rating. Uh, if you can believe it or not, there's a place where they're testing. And what they do is take sausage skin and fill it with wet sawdust and that to a certain weight and they test flushing these things through toilets. And that's how they get what's called a math rating. And these ratings are actually in a catalog that you can go through online if you do some research. Grams per flush, they, they, they actually have the rating. So when you go to, if you're gonna buy a toilet, all right, uh, this is the number that you need. Do not buy a toilet that's less than 800 grams per flush. 800 grams. That's, that's, uh, and you can buy them. You can buy a three liter flush, a really low flush toilet, but it might be 600, all right? The problem you get them is that you end up flushing it twice to get rid of your load, and so you're not gaining anything, all right? So make sure that that MAP rating is 800 grams or higher. Um, they go as high as 1,200 uh, grams per flush, so. You'll find too that if you buy the toilets, in a box that comes with the toilet, the lid, the supply line, the wax, toggle bolts, everything. Those usually have that math rating written right on the thing. If it comes from the wholesalers, you have to watch sometimes. They have different combinations of tank and bowls. And the bowl might be rated at 1200, but the tank has an orifice only at 800. So that toilet really only has an 800 math rating. So that's the other thing to look for. These things are manufactured by a myriad of companies uh, all over the world, and you can get cheap versions of toilets, but I would make sure that you're looking for the proper size rating for things. There's certain companies that have been around for a long time 
Uh, there's a toilet that comes out of the Australian market. It's one of the best ones that are out there. Uh, rentals, I used to use Coronas in a lot of them. American Standard is a very good toilet as well. American Standard's been around for a long time. You used to get more of these companies out there, but over the, the way big business ends up, one buys up another, and they use different lines for different price breaks. That's what you'll find. Kohler makes a good toilet. They make an air-injected toilet, which uses less water. It has an actual injection pump that puts and air, gives it a shot air. Sometimes you've probably been in public buildings where you flush the toilet and you think it just pulled your shoes off because the thing made such a noise. They're likely a Kohler toilet and they'd be an assist. They I cost a little more, but they are a very good toilet. And then I caution you against buying cheap toilets. There's a good lesson to be learned there that you, you often get what you pay for. You buy something that's $125 you're not going to be happy with it. But you know, you shouldn't be spending $700 on a toilet. And you can buy them for $700. Designer ones, and there's high end, fancier, the, the Victorian style. You can get them with the sinks and the toilets and the hatching. They can be quite pricey. If you're doing a home that you're staying in for a long period of time and that's something you'd like, by all means, spend what you'd like on your. I stick with the American Standard, something similar to that. That's what's called a round front. They also make what's called an elongated bowl where it actually sits out further. So if you do have where you're running into a little bit of room issues in which you're doing it in an old home renovation, the round fronted toilet actually will fit into a smaller space. You can actually get them with varying heights of seats too. Right. So this one is the cost of 16, right? You can get them a little lower, get them a little higher. Um, I know that when we did the Vinsdale home and changed all their toilets, they wanted the higher toilets simply because, you know, uh, elderly people, you know, trying to sit on those toilets, they lose, you know, they get down so far the knees give out on them and they fall the rest of the way rather than, so they wanted the higher toilets. And they're usually in, under the handicap areas of the wholesalers or the lumber yards. They're used in a lot of homes, hospitals. They're a little taller height. Okay. Tools. If you've got twist joints, you're going to have to have a decent pipe wrench. Ideally, if you're removing any of the old lines, they're probably corroded almost closed sometimes. I take them out, put a fitting in and go to copper, or they make adapters to go to Boris Polar PEX, which are a plastic product. Uh, different versions of them. Some of them use a crimping ring. The pliers that you use, you put a uh, metal ring over the pipe, it goes together and you crimp it. They also make an expansion type that you put a tool on the inside of the line. Plastic has a memory. The tool is a long tapered piece that fits in. You squeeze it and it expands it up. You take the joint, push it together, and the line actually shrinks back down to its original size. They've been used in homes for quite a few years. I still prefer copper because once I've soldered it, uh, a length of copper and air tested it in a home, I know it's not leaking. But there, Plenty of Pex and Wars in homes. I think every new home that is built nowadays has it in it. I find it's tough to make it look neat. You have to nail them a lot more. Copper lines are just dead straight every time you put them in. That's the only beef I have with new homes nowadays that I've made. I like mechanical to look neat. It looks professional when it's installed. You see the water line loop through the joist like a curly like a pig's tail to me. It, if the plumber has gone along and put clamps every second joist and it looks reasonably straight, I don't mind it. But over time, I've still stuck with copper. 
federal government and a lot of their jobs still require copper. Remember last week we were talking about <clears throat> they make a tool for everything, uh, depending on what you have to do. But if you look over there at that sink, and uh, a picture that, that uh, it, it's, it's actually all finished. It's got doors in the front and it's side, and so it's all covered in and you can't see. It's open so we can show you what we have to do there, but let's say it's all boarded in and you have to reach a, a, a nut or a bolt that's up underneath there and it's way up there and you're not going to get in there with this wrench to turn it this way, all right, because you can't get it in there. They make it like this, like this. and you turn it sideways like that, open it up, put it on there, and you can turn it down here, all right? So that if you're laying underneath your sink, and you've got, a, you've got one that's way up in there that you can't reach, you just put that up in there, and you can turn the wrench from down here. So that, and it's very nice because it, you can go it this way, or straight sideways. So I'm just saying that. They make great tools. What's it called? I have one of these. What's it called? I don't know. What do you call it? <laughs> it's a thingamabob that does the job. If you let them know that it's for doing sinks. It, it, it's, it's a form of a pipe wrench. But I mean, the thing is that it'll attach to a nut, right? Not just uh, the jaw spring loaded. And it's a spring loaded jaw. It locks when you turn one direction. You turn it with your hand all the way around. Turn the whole wrench. Imagine that, that it's attached to See, the whole wrench turns. Like, say, if, if, if this was the nut you're trying to turn, as soon as you get it on there, you turn, it turns the whole. Thank you, Brian. You get into different things. Uh, your supply lines. For years, this was the standard. You had to bend them to fit them in for your toilets and your sinks. A lot of supply lines now are just like this. This is a toilet supply line, one's for the sink of an actual nut assembly. It's metal usually, not the plastic. You'll find your shutoff valves. This is a solder on <coughs> one. These lines will actually fit to your shutoffs. And we'll show you that when we hook up the toilet. <clears throat> the beauty, of, the, the thing that, I, that I, I often tell people about this line, you'll see them, they also have a metal head, but this is not for a toilet. When you see this plastic thing, you'll notice that you can't put a wrench on it, okay? That's because you shouldn't, all right? It's designed to be put on finger pipe. It's a spring loaded thing, it's got a washer in there, it's not, you do not put a wrench or a pair of pliers on this tool because it just cracks it and it destroys the integrity of the seal, right? It's purposely made to be tightened by hand. Do not put a wrench to it. That's, that's why it's made of plastic and that's why it's round and has little wings on it so you can turn it with your hand. This end, however, attaches to the water line. It has a wrench. That fits onto there, you can use this to tighten that. That's a different story. Okay? So that, that's what I'm trying to make something new that it's not designed, not designed to do. These types of valves are pretty common in homes. Uh, every house I've always done, I put the two under the sinks for every sink, it's hot and cold, the toilet. That way, then, if you ever go to do service work on the valves and your sinks and that, you can just reach underneath, shut them off. This isn't the type that I like to use the most of. The quarter turn has a ball assembly in them that are just a quarter turn. They're a little more compact. They don't need as much room. So I've gone to a lot of these styles. These are a solder on type. I have one there that's called a sharp light type. What they are is like this. This is a cap for if I'm doing renovating and I want to pop the sinks out. These caps 
go on a line and you just push them on. And you saw how that just pushed on? You can't pull it off. You can turn the water on and it will not leak. That's called a shark bite. They sell fittings of all kinds in shark bite. Believe it or not, I've had people say they've plumbed everything in their house with shark bite. I always say if it's buried in a wall, I don't have a lot of solace in knowing that it's held together with just a barb fitter. These are little barbs inside that you can remove them. There's a tool that you buy for these things. It goes on the copper and you just pull on it. It depresses this ring and pops it off. Most plumbers use a lot of these now for if they're doing their rough-ins. They'll put these on the lines. Quick and easy. easy. Let's say you can pop that. You can't pull it off. Pass that on. And then you can put that on. That's how they work. You can buy different fittings. This one is to go from the half inch line to three quarter inch. So you can pop it on. These fittings they make fit on plastic or the, or the copper piping. A lot of these fittings still have, I don't know, I got too much of some sharp pipes. They're fairly pricey, so think out what you're going to use. If it's something that's in a cabinet that you can actually notice if there's a leak in there or something, I, I would be okay with that. Those are, are very easy to use. Uh, most homeowners would be able to put a new change out a new valve. If you go down to your water meter, there's a main valve. If there's nothing there, you can shut that off. Bear in mind if it's an older house and it's the old uh, larger style of this, when you turn them one way or the other, sometimes they leak around the stem. A lot of the time on the stem, there's a little nut. If you take that nut and just snug it down an eighth to a quarter of a turn, there is a gasket in there that's a tapered gasket that will seal those up. So if you do happen to encounter a leak on your water line, you can stop it. Ideally, when you open or close that valve, back it out till it just touches again. Don't leave it part way. It takes the slack out of the whole assembly when you just take it out. You're less apt to leak then. We've got a sink here. How many people have got one that drools water out around the taps? And you can get the cartridges for the sinks. These ones, this is the style. This has a locking ring that holds it down. We've taken them all off so that I'm not fighting with this one like we did before. This holds this assembly in. So there again, if you shut your water off, take that assembly out and go down to your local lumber yard or wholesaler, uh, home depot, then you buy a replacement for it. This is a very cheap one, it's all plastic parts. But you see, here's the thing that leaks. You see this black ring, all right? That black ring is just an O-ring, and you can take your, you can take an, uh, a screwdriver or something and pop that out of there. Right? And you just replace the O-ring? And just replace the O-ring and put it back in. Because that's what, they just, after they're used, a lot of times they get flat. Mine sometimes. Is that the part that fails? Pardon? Is that the part that fails? That's just the part that fails. But, there, you know, on this one here, which you can see here, just wait, if I can. You see, there's one other rubber washer on the metal ones. You see it on the bottom? Here's the seats. See that little black thing on the bottom? That's what shuts the water off. Okay? That black ring that's in there. You just take a screwdriver and take that off. You can replace that, that flat ring. And you, here's and your, your, and your sink. So when you turn it off, yeah, right? yeah. it gets a room sort of in that thing. Yeah. And I think... You see Dennis bought you these things here? There's a whole bunch of them in there. <laughs> They'll be held in. Just take that off and put another one of those in there. 
the, one of those will fit right in there. There's a whole assorted sizes to fit all the taps. You take that off and you just flip another one of those black things on there. And, and then your tap will stop dripping. If the tap drips, it's that black thing. If it leaks around the side, it's the old one. Okay? So if your tap is dripping, the only reason I had the other one out the end, if your tap is dripping here, okay, it's because that black thing on the end is worn out. If it's leaking around here, or in here and here, it's the O-ring. Is it still the O-ring? I have one tap that is new, everything's new, and it's, uh, you turn it on all the way and it starts to... Yeah, that, that, that's probably, is that's probably the O-ring. Is, is it like this or is it one of those single jobs, something like this? It's a single one. Yeah, well, it, it, they have they have a different system inside here, but you can change them as well. It'll be on the piece that you move back and forth for the water. They have an old ring top and bottom of that piece. Okay. And once you disassemble them, I'll show you on that one after how you disassemble it. And they're actually quite easy. Take the part that you've got for the cartridge and stuff to somewhere like Home Depot, and they've got a wall of these things. Mm -hmm. And when you look at them, you can look at 20 of them and say, which one am I the piece? But I find if you take the old piece out and have it with you, you can look at it, or 90% of the time, if you go to the guy there, the girl that's working the section, and say, I took this out, it's leaking. Can you give me an inch? He'll walk right over, pick it off for you. And that's because there's, right? there's probably yeah. 50 different types like that. Okay, especially if it's all corroded and rusty, and you might want to change the whole this whole thing rather than just the rings. And, and they run everywhere from seven bucks to fifteen dollars. So you don't necessarily have to change the whole tap assembly. That one in that sink is a white cheap one. It's all plastic bits and pieces. I find some of the Waltec and Delta products now are a little bit better product to put in. Uh, Waltec has seen a lot of rental properties. Those are the standard sort of thing. There are cheaper lines. I've seen hundreds of them. They come off the boat from China every day. And you can buy all kinds of things that look pretty nice and aren't really a solid unit to put in. And for the same money, I've seen some of them last a long time for some of them. It's, ideally it's what you're looking for out of it. If it's something you're putting together to put up for sale tomorrow and you're not worried about it, you're trying to make a dollar, so I get it. Everybody's trying to survive in this. If it's where you're at home and you're trying to get the best product for what you can afford for your own use, sometimes putting a few extra dollars in it for yourself saves you money in the long run. If I'm working on things like a hot water tank, I use a shark bait fitting. Most of them have a unit like this that the copper line goes up and ties into your plumbing. You can buy a fitting that shark bait makes that goes onto the hot water tank like this and it's flexible. So you get the hot water tank and you slide the old one out and put the two fittings on it and you slide it in and you see where it's got to go cut the lines off. You just pull down and push up like this. If it's an electric hot water tank, the average homeowner can change it himself within a couple of hours. There's only two wires and a ground that you hook up in an electric hot water tank. Very clearly marked. We'll touch on that when we get into the electrical section. I'll show you. If you're okay working around hydro, you shut the breaker off. And I'll show you how to make sure it's dead. If you have help moving the old tank out and the new one in, it's not a tough one to replace. Gas appliances, like hot water tanks and furnaces, homeowners should never mess around with them. You need a gas fitter's ticket to work on them. So if you're gonna shut it off and remove it, you have to pull a permit. The plumber says, oh, I can do that without the permit. 
and then your house burns down, and they say, oh, somebody worked on your gas. You got no insurance. So yeah, saved you a few bucks, but in the long run, if they walk away and say you've got no insurance on your home, and that's where pulling a permit means that it has to be inspected by the gas company when it goes back in. That assures you as a homeowner that that trade did the job properly. And some people I know, and I was as guilty of it when I was younger, oh, you don't need that permit. You don't need that permit. Because I was trying to save money. And I saw some things happen where people ended up not being reimbursed after a, a small disaster that ended up costing them. So what's the area that you need some of the equipment to fix? If it's a gas, a gas hauler, tank or oh, gas furnace. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's a section of the plumbing that the average homeowner isn't equipped to deal with. The, when we're on the subject of taps, are there any questions on about the taps? Do I have to cover these? This, this is a, this is an outside tap for your water holes. Okay, I think most of you have probably seen them. And the whole idea is that when you open or close or shut this tap off, it doesn't stop the water here. It actually stops the water here. So that when you put this on, this sticks outside your house, the water is actually shut off inside where it's hot. The warm air of your home is here. It's on the inside of the wall, right? So then in the winter time, you know, or in the fall, when you shut this tap off, the water is stopped here. There's no water in this tube, all right? So this doesn't freeze or crack in any way. And when these are installed, they aren't put flat. They actually are actually slanted a little bit like that, so that when you shut the water off, it stops here and it runs out or drips here. Now. You're not going to believe this, but you know, Cancade and uh, those restoration people, they probably do a hundred of these a year because people uh, forget that, that what the purpose of these things are. They leave the water holes on their tap, all right? Shut it off and then they just leave the water holes hanging on the wall outside where it always did. Well, if the water hose is on here, this tube is now full of water because it can't run away because the, the hose is still on the outside tap. So in the fall, take your hose off your outside tap so this tube will drain, right? Now, if that freezes and breaks inside and you're away, all right, it will uh, flood your basement and they have all kinds of calls because people have improperly uh, either installed them because they're like this you know, slant it backwards instead of slant it so that the water can run out when you shut it off. And if you look at the end of it, all right, I'll pass it around. You, when you shut this off, you can see right there that plunger closing. There's, you can see it right there in the end. Uh, when it opens and moves, you can see that it actually closes right there. And it up. See, there's a lot of holes that ended up back in the day that that's what they have for an exterior. Yeah, These right. are what's called a frost-free water <coughs> service. All new construction gets this, but if you're in an older home, you probably get something like this that has a valve inside that you're supposed to shut off every fall and then turn this on to drain it. My question is, I've got that with the shut off inside all the house, but what they did is they did copper up to the galvanize and then the galvanize for the outside part. Like, so I got copper and then I got crappy old galvanize. Which is it's kind an of outside tap and you don't drink that water anyway, so that's not a big deal. But the I deal is to make sure that Dennis does the exactly what Dennis said. When you shut the water off on the inside of the house, make sure you open the outside tap. Allow the water to get away. But ideally, if you want, it, you can replace them. The reason they probably cut that and left that stub in as it's cast into the foundation. So they would have to knock that out of the foundation to put the new frost free in, and then it would probably cost you a few extra dollars. But if the plumber had that in mind, that's what I would do if it was my own, I would put a frost free in. They don't have very much water pressure to the outside tap, and that's what they said is because it goes in. 
top of it, it's galvanized and it's... And the, the old galvanized is probably, it builds up with mineral on the inside and it ends up, instead of being the full diameter, that it's a pinhole sometimes and the water just trickles out of them. But normally you would get that whole piece to replace it. Kind of yes. Like It, it leaks water there? Yeah. When you, like when you turn it on, yeah. it's probably been left with the hose it's probably got a crack on it and it's frozen and cracked in this area where the tube joins onto this fitting. Okay, so I replaced the whole thing. It's replaced the whole thing. Okay. And that's exactly what George had said. It'll, it'll have been somebody will have left a garden hose on it yeah. and it freezes and the water couldn't get away. And it'll freeze the most in this area from about here out. And luckily the water's running out and not in. Because if it's a finished wall on the inside. Had, you, had it broken here, now the water's running inside your house. The fact that it's broken here, it's running on the outside of the wall, but you're lucky. So how would I replace it other than installing or something? Is it a finished basement inside? Yes. You'd have to cut a hole in the drywall where it is to get up in there to replace it. It's right beside the window, so like there would be that uh, outside piece, right? Is it on the main floor or in the basement area? It'll be in, is the ceiling finished in the basement? No, it's that top, top down. Like top ceiling? Drop, Drop ceiling? Drop T-bar and tile? Yeah, T-bar. Oh, that's perfect. It's perfect. You just take the T-bar out and you'll see where, the, the piping, the where it's joined on. If it's copper, you can cut the copper line behind the old valve, uh, find out what, pull it out, see what length it is. Because they make these in six or seven different lengths. Get one that's just a little longer, put it in the hole and see where the copper lines up. This the copper will fit into this section of the pipe. Should have half an inch and three quarters where it fits in. Yeah, like it would not be no longer than that length. No, these. I buy the long ones because a lot of the time if I'm replacing things, but they come in different lengths, you see? They come in just varied lengths. So if you do have to cut the copper line, it isn't, isn't a case where you're trying to desolder something. You can't. And then put the exact same back in. I find it easier to take a pipe cutter. And if I'm up against the valve, This is just a little wheel that cuts as you turn it in and turn it around the pipe. It cleans, cuts the pipe, and then they fit in. You cut them with a hacksaw or that, they don't fit the things real well. And I've got a small one that are in cabinets. There. Sometimes you can't get that thing to turn around, so you just have a little bit of room. So. Every house should have a shut off valve in the basement. So in the winter, in the fall, you should need to shut the hat off and then let the hat off. But you're talking for the exterior? For the exterior. Long service? Yeah. If they've got a tap, if but it's. Everybody <coughs> has one of those. The if they have a frost free, yeah. there's like the nice hat on the inside. You would have to make sure the hoses are taken off. That's the key for that. I don't want to use if they don't have eyeballs on the inside. That way you can switch these out or shut the water off if this is, this is good enough if it has a frost. If it's one of the older homes that just has that stuff, they'll have a valve inside that you can shut off. And usually they're a twist type valve. The, uh, we have uh, 45 minutes left. Or? We've still got a few other odds and ends here. I told you about the escutcheons that fit over pipes. That's what these are. They're a metal ring where you've got that hole in the drywall that I left. They're designed to go over the copper line or plastic lines that come through as a trim ring. So 
they all go just like that. So that's what you see up against there. So if you've got a bit of an ugly hole, when you cut the hole to go through, these will go on and dress them up. If it's in a cabinetry, most people don't care. I put them in for the simple fact that when people look at a home when they come, they open the cabinet, there's not some god awful cut out pack on it. They see the little trim rings around your toilet where you've got an exposed line that comes in. You get a hole. You put them in. Such a they make just nice. I mean, th this is one that it's, it's already established, and they never put a they never put a nice finishing ring on it. Okay, these are these are split rings, so that if it's a that's the size you're doing or inch and a half pipe, you can actually uh, see it separates. Or you put it on, and uh, you put a couple of screws in there, and now you can put that up against uh, because uh, you can't get it on the end of that because the P traps in the roll. So you can actually get them so that they'll split from on. And you can get them the same for here, the same way, for the copper ones. Variators for your sinks, that they screw into the bottom part where the water comes out. Aerators have been used for a lot of different things over the years. We put them in with the water retrofit program so people don't run the tap as the bottom. They come in different flow rates. They'll come 1.5, 1.2, so many gallons. You usually want them that they don't flow high rates to, to save you water. Uh, predominantly, people that leave the water run, like myself, some days. And drink. kids, when they're brushing your teeth, they'll turn the tap on and let it run. Every once in a while, they'll stick a toothbrush underneath there. Well, there's a good portion of water that, that continue runs. With the aerator, it cuts the amount of water running in half. Right? It doesn't reduce the amount of water that you need, but it if certainly saves you money. For five minutes while you brush your teeth, you'd save half the water by putting a low flow aerator in it. It takes a little longer to fill a sink if you're looking to fill the sink in that, but it's just a way to save yourself a few dollars of water. You sit and think, Toilet that drips or trickles slowly, a tap that drips, you don't think it adds up to a lot. But if you take and put a cup in it overnight and just see how much drips up out of that tap, and then you take that times 365 days times two, because you usually only take it over a 12 hour span, all of a sudden you're talking gallons of water. People are always complain about taxes. When I worked for the NRC and we did the water retrofit program, I always said the biggest saving to the taxpayer and the homeowner was being an efficient shepherd of the water. We have to build a new sewage treatment system. It's going to cost millions of dollars. We're in the process of upgrading our water treatment plant. If you cut the use of the water, as we had shown, by 27% on a residence, and did that across the city, you'd expand the lifespan of the water treatment plant by 10 years, because the whole city would save 27% of the water usage. So if you look at it from that <coughs> aspect, 27% water saving on the front end is 27 on the back end, which is going right into the sewage lagoons. So if you're using 27% less water on the front end, you have 27% less sewage you're treating at the other end. So all of a sudden, the homeowner is saving money, and as a homeowner, you're a taxpayer. If you're saving money on both those ends, it goes a long way for our environment and ourselves. Sometimes people don't think about that in those terms. But if you start taking it exponentially, one more, one more, one more. That's why I was a believer in the water stewardship program when it was here. We changed literally thousands of toilets yeah. and that in the city. We did every personal care home in the city. So you sit and think, if that personal care home saved 27% on their water or higher, uh, George made a comment, Salvation Army home here. Dinsdale home. We did it. 
and they had 40%. They advocated for our program Canada-wide because he said, George told him that it would be five-year payback for the input of their dollars to replace every toilet and shower head in that place. The captain came back and told us that within a two and a half year period, they paid for everything and were banking that money now. So they saved enough within two and a half years to pay for every single toilet and shower head in that home to be replaced. So those are areas that he was a homeowner and saved that money. And on that end of it too, they said they saved on the maintenance end because it was all brand new equipment. So they didn't have to send somebody to fix a leaking toilet, fix a leaking toilet or such. Does it matter for the hydro have that energy saving for the shower? Yes. They, I think they still have a water program. But that's in transition now. Manitoba Hydro is getting out of that end. And it's a get new organization that the provincial government has started. I don't know, you might Does the city still do that? Does the city used to give you a $100 rebate on a toilet? No, we don't. I, don't know. I think it's an energy, energy program that the province is starting up. And it's in its infancy right now. I've been following a little bit of it. And it's going to be a crown corporation, I believe, that will do province-wide a lot of those things. So kind of keep your eyes and ears open for something like that. Manitoba Hydro has kept up with the insulating program. I think it's still an option. You can get uh, windows and insulation for your home financed up to a certain dollar value, I believe it is. And a lot of it was a forgivable grant. If you fell within that income bracket, it ends up being a, a forgivable grant. Yeah. Here's a product that um, I'm totally convinced is uh, is better than any uh, duct tape. Right? Uh, you hear of uh, duct tape can fix it near anything, but if, if you have uh, the, the vent coming out of the back of your dryer or the hose that comes out of the uh, uh, exhaust fan in your bathroom where it attaches to the home. This is the, this is the product that you should use. I, I really quite like it. It's, it's uh, very easy. It, it rips like paper. It just separates the back. And this is a sort of a steel tape. It does not stretch. And when you put that on uh, something, it's not affected by heat. Cold, like it doesn't get warm or melt like duct tape would if it's on a dryer vent. And uh, trust me when I say you put that on, it it just it's that solid, right? It's a it's a good it's a good tape. So what do they call that? Then? This this product is used for sealing ductwork in homes specifically. Uh, they make a product now that's a brush-on product. It's like a heavy paste. We forced air uh, in your in your. Uh, in your furnace, you know, all of the ductwork that goes around, if you've got a, a pipe that fits in and you can feel that there's heat leaking here, this is the stuff to use, all right? Or if you've got this tin that goes around and they... It helps increase the efficiency of your duct. Sticks the tin it's, duct it's a duct seal. It's duct. just duct seal. Duct seal, yeah. I guess it would, 